Well, good morning, church, and welcome to Alive Fellowship Church. Well, we are in week two of a series that I'm calling the greatest of all time. Now, we all know that there are so many great people of the Bible, and, and the greatest of them, as I have said, is our Lord Jesus Christ. But I do believe that we can learn from amazing people uh, that are in the Bible that God used. And so last week, uh, I asked as kind of an icebreaker, what was the greatest movie of all time? Uh, this week, it's going to get real. So what is the greatest football team uh, of all time, in your opinion? I know it's subjective. And so if you look online and they use a criteria of how many Super Bowl wins and Super Bowl losses and division titles, the list would look something like this. Number 10, it would be Chicago, then Denver, San Francisco, Miami, Miami and Oakland. And then my Cowboys come in at number five. Pittsburgh, the Giants, Packers, and then the number one is the New England Patriots, and we kind of all uh, get that. Now, if I was making that list, it would be Dallas, and then it just doesn't matter. So that would be my list. It would be Dallas, and then it just doesn't matter. But, but let's get started today in our series. We all know, as we said last week, that the Bible is full of people who are amazing, and would be considered the legends of our faith, the, the goats, the greatest of all time. And, and we can't look at all the people in the Bible, but in this series, we're going to look at many of them and then end up on Easter with our Lord Jesus Christ, because without a doubt, He is the greatest of all time. As we continue this series today, and look at some of the legends of the Bible, uh, what I said last week was that they would be a lot like us in the fact that they are just normal. And they're just normal men and women that faced amazing challenges and obstacles. Uh, they, were, they were kings, they were prophets, they were common people, right? They were commoners and explorers. By learning from these heroes and legends of our faith, our goal in this series is to inspire each other and build our faith. Now, here is what they all learned, and here is what set them apart. They learned to trust God in the middle of everything they were going through. Now, last week, as a, as a quick review, you can go online and watch it, but last week we talked about no. We learned that one person can make a difference. It can make a difference in our families. It can make a difference in our generation, and, it, and we can make a difference for God. And because of that, we don't have to be afraid. And Noah's life taught us that that we should stand out, that we can do something for the first time. And we also learn that when storms come into our lives, we can continue to be faithful to what God has called us uh, to do. So this week, this week we're going to be looking at the life of Jacob. He is a legend of the Bible, and let me kind of talk a little bit about him and give some facts. Uh, his father was Isaac, and his mother was Rebekah. Jacob's grandfather was Abraham. Jacob had a twin, and I'm sure you all know this, uh, Esau, and they were like complete opposites of one another. Esau was kind of this hairy guy, and Jacob had smooth skin. The Bible tells us in Genesis 27, but look, Jacob replied to Rebekah, my brother Esau is a hairy man, and my skin is smooth. Now, as we begin with Jacob, it's important to know something because it really sets up the lessons that we can learn from him. Now watch, when Jacob was born, and he was given the name Jacob, he was given the name or the identity of a deceiver. Jacob's birth name, Jacob, uh, means supplanter, deceiver. It was given to him because uh, when Jacob was born as a second of a set of twins, he, his hand was holding uh, his twin's heel. Now, true to his name, Jacob grew up as, a, as really a, a conniver, a, a deceiver, a cheat, and he eventually supplanted his brother's position as, uh, as heir to the birthright. And so his name means deceiver, and the truth is, and he lived up to that name. That's exactly what he was doing. You see, sometimes when we're called something often enough, we might begin to believe it, and we might even begin to live up to it. Jacob did. He tricked his brother out of the blessing for a bowl of soup. He 
He tricked his father for the inheritance by pretending to be his brother. He tricked his father-in-law to increase his own herds. And then God sends him to Laban, uh, whose name means mirror or reflection. And this is what I find uh, humorous about God. So God sends Jacob to Laban, whose name means mirror or reflection, which is uh, the Jacob's kind of now looking and now he's seeing a reflection of himself because he was tricked by his father-in-law to marry both his daughters and to work for 14 years from the time of his birth until his wrestling encounter with God Jacob was associated with trickery deception I think about my life all the things that would have been associated with me before I accepted Jesus Christ. Now, all of us uh, that, that are watching right now, we could simply close our eyes and we could begin to, to think about a time when we had no relationship with God. We didn't even know who God was. We had no relationship. And when you do that, what do you see? For me, it was not a pretty picture. Because God's not in my life and because God's not in it, I, I was living a certain way, and perhaps you were too. You see, before Christ, we acted a certain way, we lived a certain way, we, we thought a certain way, we treated people a certain way. And although Jacob was a trickster, God and a deceiver, God did bless him throughout his life. So, so Jacob's now traveling towards Haran. He lays down to sleep in the desert, and he dreams of a staircase that extends to heaven uh, on which angels ascend and descend. So God appeared to him as he slept and blessed him. And this story is referred to uh, Jacob's ladder in the Bible. It comes out of Genesis 28. Meanwhile, Jacob left Beersheba and traveled towards Haran. At sundown, he arrived at a good place to set up camp and stopped there for the night. Jacob found a stone to rest his head against uh, and laid down to sleep. Verse 12, as he slept, he dreamed of a stairway that reached from earth up to heaven, and he saw the angels of God going up and down the stairway. Now, in this passage that God reveals himself to Jacob, he reaffirms the covenant he made with Abraham, promising that Jacob, uh, Jacob who will later be named Israel, that his offspring uh, will be many and that the promised land would one day belong to his descendants. Now, in this vision, in this dream, Jacob sees something similar to a ladder, maybe a, a stairway, which kind of signifies a connection between God and man. Uh, it, it's, it's God who provided the means necessary to link himself to man, to us, uh, uh, which is much different from the people uh, at a time that were trying to build the Tower of Babel. See, they tried to reach heaven by their own actions aside from the help of God. And so in that passage and in this passage, you really have two groups uh, or two thoughts about true salvation. One group tries to reach heaven based on their own actions aside from God's help, but the other has access to God based on Him providing the latter, which is Jesus Christ. As Christians, we see the dream of Jacob's ladder, Jacob's dream, is, is very important because it represents the mediator. It represents Jesus Christ who came to earth and became the ladder or the stairway for us to connect our relationship with God because He saved us. And, and Romans chapter 5 speaks to that. It says this, Therefore, since we have been uh, made right in God's sight by faith, we have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ our Lord has done, because of what He has done for us. And because of our faith, Christ has brought us into this place of undeserved privilege where we now stand and we confidently and joyfully look forward to sharing God's glory. You see, Jesus is our ideal ladder. He is really the only ladder who came to earth from the line of Jacob through the provisions of God and redeemed us so that we may live in heaven for all eternity. Now, when I think about Jacob, I'm sure Jacob grew up believing he was never good enough. 
His name meant that, deceiver. And Jacob was, was just never good enough. And you know, the truth is none of us will ever be good enough on our own to get to heaven. And that's why we need Christ. All right, let's shift gears. If I were to put a title to Jacob, it would be this. Be more than you appear to be. And that is only possible by allowing the Holy Spirit to move and to lead us. You see, to be a hero, we must become more than we appear to be. Jacob had to become more than what he appeared to be. Not, uh, not just uh, what we appear on uh, the outside. We have to be so much more than that. Now listen very carefully. How we appear to people isn't as important as how we appear to God. A first cha Samuel chapter 16 says, The Lord doesn't see things the way you see them. People judge by outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Now, our media today tells us to bulk up, slim down, get toned, get tanned. Now, one author made this quote about how we view ourselves. We struggle, he says, we struggle with insecurity because we compare our behind the scenes with everyone else's highlights, re highlights reel. And I think about that and I think that's so true. We all know and we see our lives, the behind the scenes. And what we have a tendency to do is to take that and compare it to other people's lives. But the truth is, we're not seeing any of the behind the scenes. We are only seeing the highlight reel of their life. Have you ever felt like you weren't enough. Tall enough, smart enough, beautiful enough, qualified enough, not good enough, not, not enough as a wife, not enough as a husband. And my question is, well, where did that start? Who told you that? Well, why, did, why, did, why did we allow it to affect us so much? At, at some point, we looked into a mirror and we, we felt that we just weren't enough. Maybe you tried making a basketball or a baseball team and, and, and you didn't make it and you just started to believe that you weren't good enough. And maybe at, at camp, somebody called you named or at school. Maybe you were teased or made fun of from elementary to high school, whatever. They basically said, you're not smart enough. You're not good enough. You're not enough. And here's what we know. If we feel that and if we believe that, then that can lead us to feeling alone. Jacob experienced that. So Jacob has all of this stuff going on. And then out of, out of all of this, we see Jacob's amazing story of wrestling with God. And that's what I want to focus on today. Genesis chapter 32, verse 24 and following, the Bible says this. This left Jacob all alone in the camp. And a man came and wrestled with him until the dawn began, uh, until the dawn began to break. When the man saw that he would not win the match, he touched Jacob's hip and wrenched it out of socket. Then the man said, let me go, for the dawn is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Well, what is your name? The man asked. He replied, Jacob. Your name will no longer be Jacob. He is making a change. He's making a difference. God, Jesus Christ, can make a difference. We don't have to be the same. Your name will no longer be Jacob, the man told him. From now on, you will be called Israel because you have fought with God and with men and have won. Verse 29, please tell me your name, Jacob said. Why do you want to know my name? The man replied. Then he blessed, blessed Jacob there. Uh, Jacob named the place Peniel, which means the face of God. For he said, I have seen God face to face, yet my life has been spared. That's the story, much like Jacob's ladder. That's the story of Jacob wrestling with God. And this is so important as to the importance of Jacob and the story and the message that we can learn from him. You see, to know Jacob's story is to know how his life was one of never-ending struggles. Uh, through though, though God had promised Jacob that through him would not only come a great nation, but a, but a whole company of nations, he was still a man of fears and anxieties. Uh, that, that night, an angelic stranger uh, visits with Jacob, and they wrestle throughout the night until the daytime, at which point the, the, the angelic stranger crippled him, 
uh, by hitting his hip and it disabled him with a limp for the rest of his life. It was at that moment that Jacob realized what has happened is that he saw God's face to face and his life was spared. It's, it's in Jacob's story of change that we can recognize our own struggles, our own fears, uh, the times of darkness in our life, loneliness, our vulnerabilities, the times that we feel empty and powerless, maybe because we're just believing it. We think we're not good enough. The Apostle Paul experienced this in 2 Corinthians 7. When we arrived in Macedonia, there was no rest for us. We faced conflict from every direction uh, with battles on the outside and fear on the inside. Now, all of us have lived right there, and in many cases, we are living right there right now. That we have all kinds of battles from the outside, fears on the inside. But I love verse 6, but God who encourages those who are discouraged encouraged us by the arrival of Titus. Oh, one translation says it this way, we were harassed at every turn, conflicts on the outside and fears within. In truth, God doesn't want us to live there. He doesn't want to leave us alone with all of our trials and fears, our, our battles in life. It is through Him that we can receive the power of conversion. Our lives can be transformed. The gift of not only surrender, but the gift of, of freedom and the gift of endurance, the, the gift of faith and the, the uh, gift of courage. You see, what Jacob had to learn and what you and I must learn is that I am who God says I am. David was treated like he wasn't important enough. Then he became king. Joseph was treated uh, by his brothers like he wasn't important enough to live. Then he became second in command. Timothy was not old enough. Then he becomes a pastor. Gideon was not gifted enough. Then he led 300 people to defeat an army of thousands. Esther was not important enough. Then became queen and saved her family. Moses was not good enough. Then led his nation out of slavery. Jacob saw God and it changed everything about him. And when you turn your life over to Jesus Christ, it changes everything. And it happens when we stop wrestling with God. You see, it only starts moving in the relationship God would want us to go when we stop wrestling with God about things and we begin to cling to God. So my question is, what are you and I fighting with God about right now? It's how I'm living, how I'm serving, how I'm loving. Is it pride? Is it, is it being content? Are you wrestling with God about something? If you are, I want you to know that Jesus is the only way to heaven. And if you're wrestling with that, stop. Surrender your life to Him. Live with Him and love Him. You see, with Jesus Christ, He has given us a new identity. So let me give you some, some thoughts. Let me give you some thoughts about our identity and the results of them. Identity and the results. Number one, if we think we're not good enough and our identity is rooted in relationships, that we think it's all about relationships, that will always result in comparison. If we think who we are is based on the relationships that we have, it will lead to us comparing ourselves to other people. And, and comparison always leads to competition. We will always be comparing ourselves to others if we think we are who we are because of that relationship. Now, all of us have experienced times of feeling inadequate to others. In school, perhaps you became insecure and you tried to avoid people because you didn't feel like you were enough. And the truth is, we have some serious problems to overcome in this area. We have a truth problem to overcome. Maybe you've been told a lie so many times that you believe it. We've got to overcome that. And we might have a focus problem. We focus so much on our lack and what we don't bring to the table. And we focus so much on somebody else's strength. I can't do that. They're always going to win. They are just better. We also have an expectation problem, maybe because of the bad things that have happened to us. You just continue to expect the worst. Stop. 
We have to learn to move to Philippians 4, 8. And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true, honorable, right, pure, lovely. Think about those things. You see, an identity rooted in relationships will always lead and result in comparison. And then a second one, if, if we think our identity is rooted in our accomplishments, that's going to that's gonna result in arrogance. Now, this is where we think we are who we are because of what we have done, because of what we've accomplished. And if we think that it will lead to us thinking we are the greatest uh, thing since sliced bread, that's going to just lead to, to arrogance. It's not about us. Look at Isaiah chapter 2, verse 11. Human pride will be brought down and human arrogance will be humbled. Only the Lord will be exalted on the day of judgment. And now number three, an identity that's rooted in mistakes. If we think everything uh, about us is because of our mistakes, that's going to always result in guilt. And this is where we believe that our past can never be forgiven. And so we live our lives in guilt. Do, do our mistakes define me, my value, my, my worth? My decisions define my values, but not my value. You see, my values can change. My value will not. I mean, you and I can fall flat on our face, and God still loves us. And church, listen, our value was determined when Jesus Christ created me and died on the cross for me. We ask for forgiveness for maybe missed opportunities. We ask God to help and continue to give us opportunities, and we move on. An identity rooted in relationships, if we think we're not good enough and, and we think who we are is because of relationships, it will result in comparison. If we think our identity is because of our accomplishments, that's going to lead to arrogance. An identity rooted in mistakes will lead to guilt. And then number four, an identity rooted in God results in humility. You see, where pride turns God's attention away, Humility brings God's attention to us. It's allowing Him to build us up. When, when our identity is rooted in relationships, accomplishments, or mistakes, we will never be enough. Our identity, my identity, is not in what others say. N not the choices that I have made or the circumstances that I find myself on, uh, self in. I am who God says I am. Laban became Jacob's mirror. What mirror are you looking in and comparing yourself to? How do you feel about yourself? Not good enough? Smart enough? Talented enough? Look, look, enough of that. Let God be our mirror. Let's become like His reflection, just like, like we did with Noah last week. And so like we did with Noah last week, if Jacob could, if Jacob could speak to us today, what would he say? I believe he would say this, God is more than enough. Like his grandfather before him, he needed to learn that God was more than enough. We don't, we don't have to look anywhere else or to, into anyone else to find our worth. Take a look at Genesis 17. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am El Shaddai, God Almighty. God is more than enough. That's what Jacob would say to us. He would also say, remove the distractions from living for God. In Genesis chapter 32, uh, so Jacob was alone. When he is wrestling with God, all the distractions had, had been removed. Man, it's just, it's, just, it's just him and God wrestling. So what distraction do we need to remove or limit? What has come in between us and God? Is it, is it texting, sports, social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Snapchat, Pinterest, Netflix? What is it? Luke 5, 16 says, as often as possible, Jesus withdrew to, to out-of-the-way places for prayer. How often are we alone with God? And the third thing I think Jacob would say to us is get honest with God and yourself. In Genesis chapter uh, 32... It says, what is your name? The man replied, Jacob. Jacob's name, as we talked about, is schemer, trickster, swindler, deceiver. And that's what he told God. That's who I am. I am Jacob. 
Now, can we be honest with God in who we have been and who we are right now and who we need Him to be in us? Maybe, maybe it's God, man, I'm just unla- I'm lazy. I'm unforgiving. I'm angry. I'm prideful. I think I'm better than everyone else. Now, here, here is what I love about the Bible. In Matthew 6, 6, from the Message Translation, it says this. Here's what I want you to do. Find a quiet, secluded place so you won't be tempted to role play before God. Just be there as simply and honestly as you can imagine. Can you imagine? Jacob would tell us, God is more than enough. Remove the distractions. Get honest with God and yourself. And number four, get serious. We're going to get serious about this. Move move beyond our casual relationship with God and don't just settle for enough. Don't settle for being lukewarm. Move deeper. Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you declare a blessing. Uh, Bible says in Matthew 5, 6, God blesses those who hunger and thirst for justice, for they will be satisfied. See, when you and I are hungering and thirsting for God, it is in that state that, that the Christian, the child of God, enjoys His favor. Why? Because we're living where God wants us to live. And then number five, lastly, let God transform you. Let God transform us, and we will be more than we appear to be. Jacob was leaving that place and he was limping because of his wrestling time with God because of his leg. He was forever changed after that night and he walked with a limp. He went from victim to victor, from liar to light, from deceiver to prince. When Jacob discovered who God was, he also discovered who he was. And now the picture is He walked differently. He had a limp. It's a picture of you and I walking differently. No matter where you're at in your spiritual life, no matter the spiritual question question or life problem, the answer is the same, and that is Jesus Christ. He says, I am. Throughout the Bible, God declares Himself and reveals Himself as I am. God Almighty, our problems can create a mess. Don't let them define you anymore. Our circumstances can create a mess. Don't let them define you. Uh, Don't let them define your, your marriage and your life. Our successes and failures can create a mess. Don't let that define you anymore. Let God define you and begin to live with the great I Am. Begin to look to the great I am. I'm no longer frustrated. I am provided for. I'm no longer full of doubt. I am full of peace. I am no longer lost and unloved. I am uh, I am found and loved. I am no longer sick and tired. I am healed and energized. I'm no longer guilty. I am forgiven. When we know the great I am, then we will begin to live a changed life. Let me close with this verse. 2 Corinthians 5.17 This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone, and a new life has begun. Jacob is a perfect story of a person who was seen and even did some things one way. God comes into his life, and everything changed. I pray that you would open your heart to God today. Thank you so much for joining us today. And we look forward to talking to you again next week. Next week, we're going to be talking about Abraham. I hope that you'll join us. God bless you all and have a great day.